1999, Morpheus offered Neo a choice between a red pill and a blue pill. In 2018, this country fractured between red and blue. In 2022, I'm here to tell you that if you really want the truth, more voters are neither red or blue. Yet, they have no representation, no choice, and no options. They have to choose between candidates chosen by the red people or the blue people. I'm David Ezrati, and I'm running for Congress as an American, as in red, white, and blue. I'm a veteran, an activist, and a small businessman. I'm asking you to join me in reminding the professional politicians in Congress who their bosses are. I support ranked choice voting, campaign finance reform, and a verified voter information system, all so we can stop having the best politicians money can buy. It's time to elect a veteran who will work for you, no matter what color they want to label you. Please go to electisrati.com and learn more. I'm David Ezrati, and I approve this message. Jurassic Park, you thought those little baby dinosaurs were cute until they turned into out of control carnivores. That's sort of what happens to government when we elect people based on very expensive advertising campaigns and propaganda. I'm David Esrati. I'm a veteran and a small businessman running for Congress. You don't want professional ad people and pollsters to sway your vote. All those hot button issues like gun control, abortion, borders are all politicized to stop you from voting rationally. And thinking rationally seems to be in short supply these days. Most Americans have been voting against their own best self-interest for a long time because we've allowed money to buy our leaders. A million Americans died in the last two years because our leaders couldn't leave. It wasn't that hard. Mask, distance, test, and then vaccinate. In an instant, we had billions to spend on healthcare for COVID. When for years, we've been told we can't provide healthcare for everyone equally in this country. That's an unintended consequence of the pandemic. If you think about it, our government can pretty much do whatever it wants or what the people who buy our politicians tell our leaders to do. We also had a ton of money to prop up businesses. The next thing you know, it turns out that a living wage was not only possible, but necessary. As a small businessman who won't sell you out to corporate interests and lobbyists, I can tell you that it's time to fully understand the consequences of companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google and their effect on small business. And to remind you that small business is the number one creator of jobs in this country. So this next election, don't trust this ad or any other political ad. Do your homework and think before you vote. It's time to put this ad man in Congress because I know that the best advertising is based on the truth, not the size of the budget or payroll. Or you can just vote based on who has the money to buy their way into Congress and live with the consequences. I'm David Ezrati, and I approve this message. Hi, I'm David Ezrati, and I'm running for Congress. And I'm running against Mike Turner, who has been your congressman for 10 terms or 20 years, and he's never had a live stream town hall where you can interact with him. He hasn't had a town hall. He doesn't talk to you unless, of course, you give him lots of money. That would be the 19 billionaires from out of state or lots of defense contractors, um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, and the home builders, which is interesting. And today we're going to talk about affordable housing. I bought an affordable house. It is not an affordable house anymore. What happened was gentrification, where people, we finally built, had enough houses fixed up in the neighborhood and we did all this work. And now people want to live here and are willing to pay really too much money for old houses that have been, some, and some of them, hacked together by home flippers and for others that, you know, people basically 
outgrew because they got to be of an age where they didn't want to climb steep stairs. I like my old neighbors better, to tell you the truth. Some of these gentrified people, not so much. They pay a lot for their houses. They expect it to be something it's not. It's an inner city neighborhood. It's an old neighborhood. The historic zoning designation protected a lot of the homes. It didn't protect all of them because before that they were tearing them down and building absolutely crap multifamilies that didn't fit in at all. And I don't have a problem with multifamilies. I have a problem with the way they managed it. So, we used to have a housing project down at the end of the street. That was public housing. And it had been built in the 70s and it was torn down in the last 10 years. And they're talking about building patio homes. And they built two higher density apartment buildings over there. Now, what's the difference between the public housing and the higher density apartment buildings? Well, the public housing did not have a mix of people and it was all poor people concentrated in one place. And that, I can tell you up front, is a recipe for disaster. The way good city planners, the way programs should work, you try to mix your income stratas. In America, we've done everything we can to stop that from happening. We've got people who live in gated communities who pay fees for road maintenance. They basically live on their own little grid. And then there are people who live in rural areas where they can get away from everybody and rules and regulations and zoning. They can build whatever they want. And then we have sprawl. And sprawl is what happens when people keep trying to move into new things because they're not willing to take care of the old things. So, what happens over and over in this country is we basically discard what we have. My neighborhood was discarded when I moved in. Now, some people had been working for a few years before that and gotten historic zoning designation, but nobody put signs up or told me. So, I, I broke the rules and got in trouble, and that's what started my political career. However, that that. The political career that's never gotten me elected, by the way, other than priest and captain. But that's a whole other story. But I bought my house for $14,000. $14,500. I'll say it again. $14,500. 1986. January 28th, the day the first space shuttle blew up. I bought the building I'm sitting in right now for $2,400. I bought that on October 19th. 1987, I believe. No, 88. The day the stock market hit, crashed 500 points. $2,200. And so I bought two affordable buildings. I tried to buy a third building on the day the Gulf War started, the first one. didn't That didn't go through. And then I bought two more houses and nothing happened. So I'm past the disaster cause relationship between buying properties and everything else. I see a question from Jennifer about Ober donating to Turner and Ober being the Sprawl family. Um, as far as I know, Ober has supported Turner in the past. I didn't see them on the list this time, but um, yeah, and Ober is one of the con contractors who built the new housing down here, the, the high density apartments. But I bought this building for $2,200. It had $2,400 in back taxes. Now, here's the crazy part. This building was built in 1895 as a corner grocery store. It was built so that you could be the shop owner in the house behind and walk out your back door onto the back porch and into the store. Now, at some point, I don't know if this was the original or happened later, the upstairs had a single apartment in it. But I do know after World War II when all those soldiers were coming back, America had a serious housing shortage and people were chopping things up in any which way to make room for those soldiers returning. Around that time, we ended up with two more apartments down in the back part of the, of the store. So you had the store up front, two apartments in the back, one apartment upstairs, 
all in a 1,500 square foot building. Now think about it. the two downstairs apartments were probably 250 square feet each. Upstairs was probably a little under 500 and the main um, store was 1,000 square feet. And that was a grocery store for the neighborhood. We don't have grocery stores that size anymore. We have put all of those little bodega corner stores pretty much out of business. And so along with owning a house, you now also have to own a car. And this is where we started having problems with housing. At some point in the 50s of the nuclear generation, the nuclear family, the idea was you would have two cars in every garage, you'd have a yard and a house and the Huber Homes and um, large scale deve developments like Levittown where they built the same thing over and over and over and created communities was all the rage. And Huber is absolutely a fantastic example of American ingenuity on providing housing affordably for a lot of people very quickly. That community was built really fast because they kept it simple. So you have the largest community of brick homes in the country, as they used to say on the signs. And even there now you'll see that they are building much more high density multifamily units uh, especially on the other side of I-70. Why do people want to live in Huber Heights? Well, one, it's right next to the highway. It makes it really easy to get to other places. It's close to the Air Force Base where they have a large transient community of middle-income people who are looking for a good school system with a good athletics program. So you get people going to either Fairborn, Huber Heights, or Beaver Creek as the primaries. You might get some officers going down into Centerville um, but, and Kettering. But for a majority of them, enlisted in low ranks, Huber is the place. And they are allowed to live in a home where the taxes don't go up too much, where the maintenance is pretty low. And there was lots of factory work, as Jen points out. So there, were, there was GM, there was Frigidaire, there was NCR, there was Westinghouse. There were all kinds of factory jobs. And you could make it with one income and pay your relatively affordable house payment on these homes and live in a good community. Now in Dayton, what happened was we had busing instituted in 1971 and people who could or who wanted to or who were racist, they moved to the suburbs. Little known fact, Oakwood until 1965 wouldn't allow Jews to live there or Jews to be buried there. So we've had racial issues divide communities. We've had an exodus of a whole bunch of people, and they had to live somewhere, so they moved out to the suburbs. Kettering grew, Washington Township, Centerville, all these things grew. And what keeps happening is your tax base has to increase because now you are supporting more infrastructure, more roads, more sewers, more water lines, more electric poles, more gas lines, all these things, more police stations, fire stations. Instead of keeping everything compact and, dense, and keep the density high, we are making people commute further, drive more, driving cars, because we don't believe in public transit here. We have no light rail. We have no trains. We have a bus system that is basically considered that of, for poor people, which is totally not the way you should look at public transit. We build our shopping malls far out in the middle of nowhere in cornfields because it was cheap instead of keeping everything concentrated downtown. And this has caused... Governments to grow. We now have 30 jurisdictions in Montgomery County. And we've created a problem because of the, the sheer number of households. We've been growing physically for years. We keep spreading out, spreading out, spreading out. But we're still at the same general size. We're at 500 odd thousand for the, for the Dayton area. Uncontrolled growth causes all kinds of problems. So some of the problems, 
is we have a bunch of houses that are abandoned, fall into disrepair, have people go in, scrap them, take out copper pipe, copper wire. And that causes a real problem because they, those houses are hard to bring back. Banks do redlining. The number of homes that they have torn down in Dayton is astonishing. And they still have tens of thousands to tear down. And guess where that money comes from? It's usually federal money that's being used to demolish homes. And that's not something that federal money is, should be doing. You don't get anything by tearing things down. You get things by building things up. So not everybody can rehab a house. I learned the hard way about some of the things I had to do. It's not something, I know Bob Vila made it look easy on this old house, but it's not that easy, okay? And it's not that cheap. And there's a lot of learning curves there. But what we fail to do is provide clean, affordable housing on public transit lines near jobs in a way that it all fits together, where there's a grocery store that you can walk to, a library you can walk to, a school you can walk to, a drugstore you can walk to. That is the ideal. If you really want to know what went wrong in America, it was our focus on cars. Cars are expensive. Cars take up space. You have to park them. You have to drive them. You have to insure them. You have to repair them. Whereas if you have public transit, you can just get on the bus and run your errands and come back, or you can walk to the local store, to the corner store, whatever. Everything is transformed. So instead of spending money tearing buildings down, we could institute programs that reward you for fixing up one's that instead of so they don't get torn down and i've talked about that before but most importantly if we're going to use tax policy as a way to manage economic development let's start looking at walk to work tax credits where companies get credit for having a workforce that doesn't have to burn carbon to get to work miami valley hospital invests a lot of money in this neighborhood and build a whole bunch of houses down in the fairgrounds neighborhood for their employees so they could walk to work. They tried the same thing at Good Sam and then tore the hospital down. But again, by focusing on getting employers close to their workforce, we win all over. And that walk to work tax credit thing, I proposed that quite a long time ago. It's pretty easy to manage. You know where the taxpayer lives, you know where their employer is, and you just have a, a map. And if they're within a certain mileage, boom, you get a credit. No promises of job creation credits or anything else. Let's focus that. Now, there's a program called the Hub Zone Program, which is for historically underutilized business zones, where government contracts are supposed to be steered to people who have businesses in hub zones and have employees that live there. But it's really hard program to get into because you can't control where your employees live. But if you, even if you do, trying to get contracts pushed through on, on those grounds doesn't seem to work very well because the federal government pays lip service to that program more than actual implementation. So part of the problem, I think, is we still believe that everybody should live in a single family home. The number of people living in duplexes, triplexes, quads, eight units, has gone down as we continue to do this sprawl, single family house thing, two car garage, etc. One of the trends that sort of took off, which I didn't think was the greatest idea, was I liked part of it, but I didn't like part of it, was tiny homes. The great thing about tiny homes is it gave you a sense of ownership and security and that you owned it yourself and it wasn't super expensive. But the, again, the problem is you still need some place to store your lawnmower. You still need some place to have a washer and dryer. You might want to be able to entertain more people. So I saw that primarily as a way to build micro communities with a center shared space and a bunch of tiny homes around it. And what we're really talking about is how to get people out of homelessness. And this is the problem. In Dayton, we've got lots of space to build tiny home communities. And we're not. 
or put in what's called ADUs, accessory dwelling units in backyards of houses, in-laws, suites, those sorts of things. But we don't do that either because again, the sprawl factor. But in places like San Francisco or Cupertino, there are people who provide services to the people there, but they have to drive an hour to get to someplace affordable because zoning limitations, height restrictions, density restrictions, schools not wanting to have poor people in them have created barriers to building high density housing. My father was a big proponent of high density housing. I lived in an apartment building from um, ages three until I was eight. And then we got into a duplex and then we bought our own home. My father always says he liked them better because you could always call the super to fix things. He wasn't big on fixing things. He later learned how the hard way when he bought a house and had to work on it. But there are people who are making a lot of money in high density housing. One local man who's quite wealthy is Larry Connor, who's been to space and been to the Marina's Trench. And he's the Connor Group has built lots of housing. Now he's experimenting with an urban school. But the housing he's building isn't in core center cities. It's out in suburbia for the most part. And what we need to do is figure out how to start reversing sprawl and try to build housing that works for people of all income levels. So if you looked at Disney's experiment with their community called, it was a planned community called Celebration in Florida. And they built this as part of Disney's, you know, vision of the futures. And what was interesting was that they required at least, I think it was originally 15% of the homes to be affordable for low income. And then they had another for market level and then a high end and they forced all this together with schools and walkable neighborhoods. If you saw the movie The Truman Show, that's so that's celebration. That's the the concept. It's sort of a throwback to old communities. And they thought about the importance of making sure there was racial integration, economic integration, and opportunity. And of course these people would work mostly for Disney, it was a company town, which by the fact, by the way, South Park was originally a company community. A lot of the people here either worked at NCR making cash registers or at the Barney and Smith car works making train cars at the time around the turn of the century. Those were two of the big employers. In fact, the people who built my house, um, he was a salesman, but the next people who owned it had worked at the Barney and Smith car works as carpenters and then became um, after the flood they started the Dayton Casket Company at my house and that company is still going. So in the federal government how do we incentivize things? Well we tell developers that if you have this many high income or market level you can get a break a tax break, a sizable tax break, by making sure that you have a percentage of your units that equal the amount of people in lower incomes in your greater metropolitan statistical area. And you get extra credit if it's if the big one has more and you've got less in your community and you increase those numbers of units that are affordable, you get a bigger tax break. Really simple math, really simple to do and we could spur affordable housing. The other thing about affordable housing is we have to understand that not everybody needs all the same things that you might think you need. We generally are building units that are way bigger than what they do in other countries. And in fact, this is one of the things I love about IKEA. They're very good about efficient use of space. And if you go into IKEA, they have an apartment set up at 250 square feet, one at 500 square feet, just to show you how that works right inside their store, how you fit it in, how you make it seem comfortable and homey. My friends who live in New York City often live in apartments that are 300 square feet where the bed is over the kitchen in a room with a 
12 foot ceiling. You have to climb a little ladder to get up to the bed. Those things you don't find here. And in fact, some of the things we did here, they hassled us with building codes that just didn't make sense for a 100 year old building. In fact, it was almost impossible to get the zoning change because this building had been vacant for a while and trying to turn it into something that was the original use was actually a variance that I had to get. There are requirements for parking spaces. Again, if all my employees live in the neighborhood, I don't need parking spaces, right? There's no credit for that given, and that's what we need to look at. We need to look at ways to encourage businesses to have their employees live nearby in walkable communities, because that's one way that we will fight climate change and build stronger communities. I don't see any other questions, but I do see Jennifer commenting that Miami Township and Washington Township should be under Miami's Burger Kettering or Centerville. The reality is urban townships is an anomaly of Ohio and Ohio needs to wake up. And in fact, we don't need all these different communities. We should look at Unigov like they've done in Columbus, like they've done in Indianapolis, like they're moving to in Cuyahoga County, like they've done in um, now in Louisville. And that's why I have the nonprofit Reconstructing Dayton to try to bring Unigov to Dayton. That's just not going to happen right now because I'm running for Congress. If you've got any questions or you want a topic for tomorrow or you have anything else, please put it in the comments. We read all the comments. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. Mark, you, it's a good video today. Thank you. Again, these are all off the cuff. I don't have scripts or anything else. I'm doing this as practice for when I have to speak in front of groups and for Turner and also to make sure that you can see how I think because I'm going to be your representative speaking for you in Congress, hopefully, and hopefully you understand that I can make an argument or discuss ideas that are bigger than what I get handed by the billionaires who've been running our politicians forever. Lobbyists shouldn't be the smartest room people in the room, thank you. We need creative people, creative problem solvers in Congress. My website is electasrati.com. It's been evolving. Hopefully you'll like some of the changes. The website, uh, the YouTube channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified every time we go live or launch a new video. The average Joe video seems to be pretty, pretty popular and average Joe himself is sitting here running the board and he's got another one almost ready to launch. So look for that. I need donations because I don't have billionaire friends, so electisrati.com forward slash donate, or you can, of course, donate through Act Blue. We appreciate it. That gets you on our weekly newsletter. So I don't sit there and say the sky is falling, but I ask kindly to, for a donation, and I give you information about what's been going on. Again, the big news coming up is we're waiting for a shipment from Shepard Ferry, who designed the Hope and Change posters for Obama. He's sending us some posters that we are going to be giving away to donors through a random drawing, and then through an upcoming fundraiser. And I hope to see you all there. I'm working on the details of that. So thank you very much for tuning in. This has been my talk about how we do affordable housing. And there's other things we need to look at, like geothermal for heating, solar for electrical power, working on clean energy integration, as well as highly insulated homes that are low on VOCs and built for health because my house was full of lead paint, my office was full of asbestos, and those things are expensive to get rid of. We need to have safe housing for poor people as well. My neighborhood's come a long way. Houses are selling now on this street for $250,000. We had one round the corner that sold for almost 400. It was not that nice, not very long ago. So things are changing in my neighborhood. And the banks have not been really helpful at all. In fact, the house behind me went for 210 only because the guy had an offer for 219, but the banks wouldn't appraise it for that. Now it would probably go for close to 300. So we've got a whole lot of things to change. I also failed to talk about it all was the collapse Wall Street where they boned most homeowners in 2009. We bailed out the banks and the taxpayers paid for it. A lot of people lost their homes and that was wrong. We need to put those people in prison. <laughs> One last funny thing. 
at the end of my VA appointment yesterday, they asked me, what's one thing that would give you joy? And I said, is this a new question? She says, oh, yes. Because they always ask, you know, at first if you're, you know, if you're short of food, shelter, feeling depressed, those are the things they ask, the standard suicide question. So they asked and said, what would give you joy? And I said, seeing Donald J. Trump go to prison. She said, I can't put that down. I said, oh, yes, you can. And so she said, patient said I had to put this in. Donald J. Trump going to prison would make him happy. So let's hope that happens and happens soon because we can't handle any more of this us versus them. We got to work together as Americans and make this country better. I hope to be your congressman to help to ha that happen. Make sure everybody can afford a home and live in a community like mine where people come together and neighbors become friends. I'm David Osorati. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow at four o'clock.